Before we get started, make sure you subscribe to our channel. If you're on YouTube, click the alert notification button and if you like the video, please click like and share. Thank you so much for being on our webinar today. Um, we are Give a Grad a Go and our mission is to help graduates find jobs that they love. Um, as I just mentioned, we're in collaboration with the University of Edinburgh's Women in Politics and International Relations Society and Student Here, and we're joined by our amazing guest speakers, Lindsay Duncan and Amber Seller. So thank you guys all for being here today. Um, and I also just want to mention that if anyone has any questions at all, please just pop them in the chat. So as our name suggests, we offer graduate recruitment. We specialise in first careers, your first, second or third jobs. So even if you're a graduate and you've had a couple of roles, we're here to help students and those early careers as well. So what we do in terms of when you sign up and the next steps, we'll actually help you to prepare your application for jobs. This involves going through your CV with you, giving you interview tips that are personalised to the role that you're applying for. And this is all a free service. One of the main things we do as well, and the reason why we put on these webinars, is to connect you with each other, with us, and also to new opportunities and other employers. So one of the first things that we always advise graduates to look out for and consider when they're first looking for a job is what industry is right for you. So at Give a Grad a Go, unlike quite a lot of other recruitment companies, we actually recruit for over 15 sectors. Um, usually with recruitment, it's quite tailored just towards marketing perhaps or just towards tech, but we are more varied in that sense, whereas our niche is just with early careers. So what we always advise people first is what experience do you have in this industry? And this doesn't necessarily mean just your degree. So perhaps if you did English at university, you don't necessarily have to become an English teacher or write a book. You can, you know, those kind of skills that you learn, those analytical skills can be put towards anything. And um, our lovely guest speaker, Amber, will go into a bit more information about that as she's now gone from English degree to working in data, artificial intelligence. So the other thing we always say to consider is what industries are you actually interested in? It's so easy at university to think, oh, I'm going to go for this job. I really want to do this. But it might actually be that that name of the role isn't actually what the job is. And you might find that you actually don't want to do it. And especially in difficult times searching for jobs, that's really important to consider. Because even if you land a new job when you're searching and you're desperate for your first role, if you don't enjoy it, you won't last long and you will just be more unhappy. So the best thing is to think of what you want yourself and always put your needs first. Um, another thing to consider is, are you interested in working for a startup or a large corporation? So we get so many graduates that come to us and say, can you help me get on the biggest grad schemes? We wanna work at the top four. And we always say, this isn't often the case. You know, if you're starting at a smaller company, you can find yourself with more responsibility and faster progression, which is really important, especially in those early stage careers. And I guess going back to sort of skills that you might have learned in your degree or other work experience that you have, think about what you've enjoyed in the past and what you might enjoy in the future. When you come through Give a Grad a Go, our recruiters will ask you this and they will look for jobs and find a role that they think will match your skills and match the things you want to do, um, which is why quite a lot of the recruiters like to describe themselves as matchmakers, because essentially that is what they're doing. Having said that your degree, you know, you're learning the skills from it, it is still good to think of ways that your degree will help you get a job in that industry. It doesn't have to be the be all and end all. And please don't be afraid of applying for jobs that you might think, you know, I can't do that because it's not related to my degree. Do still apply, but look at what skills that you've learned from your degree that you can apply in that job because each one is different and it's really important to tailor your CV to that. So the next thing, a couple of CV tips that I got given from our expert recruiters that work with us. Um, of course, do your research at the beginning, look at the company, find out what they've been doing. Perhaps they've just had a big investment. So it could be good in the interview to then ask them and say, what are you planning to do with that investment? What opportunities will that give for your employees? Show a real interest. And you can do this just by looking them up online. You know, it's really easy to do. Um, and then stay informed with what they're doing as well. You know, look at newspaper articles they might have been in. Um, secondly, we would say to show off your skills. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, look at all those things that you are able to offer the company. Look at those skills that you've gained from your degree and your work experience. Whatever it is, um, it will be valuable to the company and find a way to make that relevant. 
Um, the final thing that we suggest is actually connecting with the hiring manager or the recruiter on LinkedIn. There's no harm at all in asking them just before you start applying and before your interview what they're looking for. Ask them for more information. Ask them for any tips because it will show your initiative um, and really help them get an idea of what you're looking for and what you can bring to the company as well. So next we have our guest speaker, Lindsay who is going to be telling you about how, when you do connect with those hiring managers on LinkedIn, how you'll be able to do that. And I'm just going to make you the host now, Lindsay, so that you're able to change the slides. Um, is that all worked okay? Yeah, thank you. No uh, everyone, nice, nice to be here. Um, so I've been in B2B marketing for about 20 years. I've worked for corporates, startups, and for the last 10 years, I've been running my own marketing consultancy. And there's something that's been really key every step of the way, particularly when I've been changing jobs and looking to progress my career. And that's been presentation. And I'm by presentation, I mean how I present myself online, visually, and with the words I use, my CV, my LinkedIn profile. And LinkedIn has become increasingly important over the last few years. And this year, because of what we've all faced, we haven't got the luxury of going to career fairs, we can't do that lovely face-to-face -face networking and rapport building. So when you're applying for jobs, it's highly likely people are gonna check you out on LinkedIn. So for the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna pack in a whole bunch of advice that will help you understand how your LinkedIn profile works and what you can do to make sure it's really fit for purpose and helps you stand out from the crowd because there's a lot of competition out there right now. Um, and I know this, this session is all about inspiring women in business and. I hope that what you learn from me in this session is going to help you feel more confident about getting out there and how you present yourself to your future employer. If you weren't convinced, there's a lot of people on LinkedIn, 675 million people in the world, 28 million in the UK. 22% of these people are senior influencers and decision makers, the people that might be your future boss or recruiter. So they're on there. Recruiters are particularly active. Um, now, there's some useful context here. These, these stats were pre-COVID, so the chances are people might be spending a little bit longer on LinkedIn than they used to because we haven't got the luxury of seeing people face to face, so we're probably spending more time looking at people on here. But the point here is, on average, people are only spending 17 minutes a month. And the reason I'm mentioning this is we're really quick to judge when we land on someone's LinkedIn profile, we make snap judgments based on the images we see and the words that we use. So I'm gonna now take you through first things that people are gonna see in your profile and show you how to make them stand out and do a good job. Yeah, and as I, as I said, you know, more, we have to think about our profiles online. It's so important that we have leave a good, strong digital footprint and that we can build trust when people, with, with people when they look at us and our profiles. So how do we create the right first impression? This is your LinkedIn, this is the your real estate if you like. So everything I'm showing you on screen here is pretty much what sits above the fold on someone's laptop or, or PC screen. So if we start at the top here, this banner section, is often such a missed opportunity for people. So this, this image you see here is your standard LinkedIn. It's just what LinkedIn puts in here, but you can upload an image here. So that's a perfect opportunity. If you can find a visual that either says something about you as a person, your professional experience, your background, and what you offer to a future employer, job done. So really think about whether there's an image that can help you stand out and use that bit of real estate there. Next thing down, the obvious one, your profile picture. Have a professional profile picture. Make sure it looks smart. And also make sure in your settings that your profile uh, picture is visible. There's quite a lot of stats that tell us if we don't see someone's profile picture before we connect with them, we're maybe less likely to engage. So if you think about your future boss or future recruiter, if you're connecting with them, make sure that your profile is set to be visible. Okay, next thing down is this headline statement. Now, classically, people tend to put in their job position in the company they work for, or for, for, for people, for students, it might be um, 
previous job you've had or some expertise that you've got to offer. Now, what's good news here is LinkedIn expanded the number of characters you can use here. So you can use that to include some of the key skills you have to offer, expertise, or even something about what you're looking for in your next career move. So use that space because it's, it's pretty much the first thing someone's gonna read about you. All right, so this next section down here, called the highlight section, this is a really interesting one. So there's research out there that tells us people are five times more likely to connect with you if you've got a shared connection in common. And that makes sense, right? It shows that you're kind of in their world and perhaps you're relevant, you're, you're worth looking at. So, you know, if you think about whether you, when you're connecting to a future boss or recruiters, you know, have a look at who else you might be connected with or you, who else you could connect with first. So we, we, we look at this, when we're looking at someone's profile, that all plays a part in the picture that we're building with someone, as does shared interests. So on LinkedIn, you can follow companies, groups, and influencers. So if I was thinking about a job that I'm going for, I'm gonna think, well, who should I be following? I want, I want to show to my future employer that I'm tuned into their world and I'm following all the right people because it's one of the first things people see about you. So that's a really useful tactic to have in mind. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The next section down. So in, in, when someone lands on your profile, there's just the start of your about section, but this is super key. This about section is where you get to talk about the skills and experience and expertise you offer your future employer. So it's key to get that right. A little bit like a cover letter, um, if you like, but that's key, uh, key real estate. And finally, this is a kind of a new section. Not everyone knows about this. LinkedIn rolled it out a little while ago. This featured section lets you include pictures, visuals, videos, articles. So if you've got you know, relevant experience and content that will kind of bring your, you as a professional to life, use that section because that's the next thing someone's going to see about you. So if you've done writing or if you've got work examples, you can put it in there. So I guess my final piece of advice here is just every time you're, when you're working on it, every section of your profile, just think about your future recruiter or employer and what they need to know about you. All right. So quick one. Also bear in mind that a lot of the time we're looking at LinkedIn on our mobile. And that means that um, the first characters we see are a little, they're shrunk. So the headline statement and the about section, those opening statements need to really work hard. So if you can, have a really punchy opening statement. Okay, this is your checklist. So on the table on the right here, these are all the sections in from all order from top to bottom that you can use to fill out your LinkedIn profile. So what you should aim to do is make it as complete as possible because these are all the chances you've got to tell the world about your experience. So education, licenses, volunteer experience, skills and endorsements, recommendations. If you've got recommendations from previous employers, have them in there and other accomplishments and interests. It really helps build a rich picture for your future employer. Also it might be interesting to know that the about section um, if you if you include key skills, um, people might find you by searching on those skills on LinkedIn. So it's worth just thinking about how to, to uh, thread some of those into your about section. Um, and this is maybe a bit of a, a minor point, but if any of you are contemplating broadcasting, so if you want to be seen posting on LinkedIn, LinkedIn likes it if you have a complete profile and they give it an all-star rating if you have a nice complete profile. But when you have an all-star rating, basically LinkedIn gives your posts more visibility. It's a little bit fickle, but that's how LinkedIn works. So it's another good reason to have a nice full profile. Okay, so I protected the names of the people, by the way. These are just examples, but Something else to think about, and, and this, this person maybe hadn't realized that when they entered their position as looking for a new role and their company is looking for a new role, this is how it looks when you land on their profile. So be smart about how you're using the position, your job position and, and, and the company you're working at. Just make sure it reads well and says the right thing. 
Um, a little bit of housekeeping for you. So often when we set up our LinkedIn profiles, uh, we don't often go back to the contact details because there's not really much reason to do it. But um, something you might not know about is your profile link. So LinkedIn will typically give you first name, surname, and a bunch of numbers and letters afterwards. You can actually edit that to make it something a little bit prettier. So play around with it. So it could be, you know, underscore between your first name and surname or something else just to make it look a little bit um, cleaner. Uh, now, I remember my email address as a student was not fit for public viewing. So again, make sure that you don't have something like boozehound99 at hotmail.com and it's something that's appropriate and that you've got all the right contact details in there too. Okay, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time looking at what makes a good about section because this is the first thing someone might read in, in detail about you as a professional. And this is a brilliant example. Um, she starts with a lovely opener. It's passionate and it's personable. In, an, in the next paragraph, she gives a really concise overview of what she studied, the focus of her career. She pulls out transferable skills that she's got and other key experience, which is really important. Then in the third paragraph, she goes into a little bit more detail about that experience. And she also talks about some of her personality traits. She's really building a nice picture of herself. And then in the last section, she talks about some other interesting aspects about her and her background and interests, just to build a really rich picture of her and what she's got to offer. So I find this a really nice example. And there's just some inspiration for you guys when you're writing yours. And going back to that picture that, she, that, that you might want to feature in the, the top of your profile. So here she's, she talks about um, working for a local charity shop and um, cooperating with an NGO in the Czech Republic. So her headline image is this lovely image of the Czech Republic. So there's just a nice connection there. And it's just a, a pretty image that sets her, her profile apart a little bit. Okay, uh, we're nearly there. Your experience section is really important. You need to, you obviously want to show that you've got some good, strong experience to offer. So try and build it out as fully as you can. Bring the most relevant work experience you've got to the top. And then where you've got other work experience, don't worry if it doesn't feel directly relevant, but just try and really draw out the most transferable skills. It shouldn't matter where you got them from because they're transferable. And finally, I mentioned earlier about the, um, the role that this, this interests and, and the, the groups uh, that you follow can play. So this is just a snapshot of what mine looks like. You can see I've got some interests that tell you about my profession, marketing. You can, so for clients of mine, they can see themselves in here and I follow groups that they're interested in, see my education, and also I like bigger ideas, so I, I follow TED. So have a think about how you can show that you are tuned into all of the right stuff that is relevant to the industry you want to work in and the employees that you want to engage with. I wish you all the very best in building a strong LinkedIn profile and in your career searching and interviews. And I'm going to hand over now and uh, enjoy the rest of the session. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, right, I'm just going to share. Oh, Lindsay, would you mind making me the host again? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. OK, cool. Uh, right, so I'm just going to share my screen um, and then introduce. Oh, where has it gone? One second. So um, I'm going to do a quick overview of some more tips that we have from Give A Grad A Go um, before we go on to introduce the University of Edinburgh. Um, so our first top tip that we would suggest is prepare your interview software and technology. This is just to ensure that everything's running as smoothly as possible. Um, so again, as Lindsay said, with the email, make sure that you've got a professional username. And it's also a good idea to carry out some test calls and test that your Wi-Fi is working properly beforehand. This sounds really obvious, but it can be one of those things that you think, oh, I won't need to, I'm sure it's fine. And then 
get to the interview and you're stuck with a problem. So better to be safe than sorry. Um, our second top tip is to find an appropriate setting for your video interview. So quite a lot of people, again, this, these all seem like such obvious things, but our recruiters have said that they've noticed it so much. They'll be speaking to people and they might have clothes or uh, like rubbish basically just lying around their room. Um, so yeah, hide the washing, make sure that's not available. Even just put it out of sight. Um, our, in our past webinar, our recruiter will had used a good example. He had a whole basket of washing, but you couldn't see it in the shot. And as soon as he tilted his camera screen, it was right there, which is what we're trying to avoid. Um, you also want to make sure that your screen is as bright and clear as possible, which obviously is a little bit more tricky now it's getting darker earlier. Um, but just test this out and see what you're able to do beforehand. Um, our third tip is dress to impress. So although everything has turned virtual now, um, still dress as though you would for a usual interview. You will be able to see this if you're an interviewer and it will be something that they're especially going to be looking out for now due to COVID that everything has gone virtual. So yeah, ditch the trackies <laughs> um, and make sure that you do scroll up as much as you would usually. Um, and going on to our fourth tip, so display positive body language and maintain eye contact. Um, a trick that uh, Will, again, our recruiter that was on our previous webinar, he said to me, make sure that your camera, when you're speaking to someone, is at the top right where you would be looking. And what this means is that when you're speaking to them, it looks like you're having the conversation with them, you're maintaining that eye contact. So if I move my, my screen here, I'm looking at myself, but obviously it looks like I'm looking down. Um, and this can be very distracting to the interviewer. Um, of course, make sure that your posture's there, you don't wanna be slouching. You can still pick up on body language sometimes, even through of like virtual video setting. Um, and employers that have been recruiting for graduates that we've that through us that we've actually spoken to have picked up on this quite a lot and said to really push how important it actually is um so our other tip is just to consider the types of interviews you will normally just have a virtual one where people ask you questions back and forward but we have had a couple of experiences where employers have asked for a pre-recorded video interview um sometimes with these type of interviews you actually only get two takes of them so it's still really important to prepare for this recorded clip as you would a normal interview, as they still might spring up some surprising questions. And you want to make sure that if you can't get it right the first time, then you definitely can the second time. They know that you'll have had that extra time to prepare and that you won't be as on the spot. So they will be expecting a much higher standard. So, of course, preparation is key. But the bonus of having an interview at home virtually is that you can have notes down and you can use them for reference. And this won't be as obvious as it would be face to face. Um, and then the final thing we say is to prepare an example video interview answers and questions before. Um, prepare for a range of things. Um, it sort of depends on what industry you're going in. But at Give a Grad a Go, when you are going for an interview, you can actually speak to your recruiter and ask them what type of questions you can expect and what type of questions that, that employer usually asks. Um, we obviously want you to get the job as much as you do. So your recruiter will be there to give you all those tips and give you insights about that specific company and about that specific industry that you're looking to get involved in. And if you are interested to find out a bit more, there's the little QR code to our video interviews questions um, if you'd like to check that out as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the University of Edinburgh Women in PR and International Relations. Thank you guys so much for your help organising the webinar. It's great to have you here. Um, I'll move on to the next slide and let you introduce yourselves. Okay, so hi everyone. We are the Women in Politics and International Relations Society. Uh, we're a brand new society at the University of Edinburgh that's seeking to establish a community for all genders with a main goal of empowering women in politics and IR fields. So our main purpose was to open up the conversation about the participation of women in these fields and give visibility to so many amazing women who have been admitted for so long. So I'll quickly just run down our, uh, what our committee is made up of. So we're five members, all from different PIR career paths and in different academic years. We've got Andrea just there, who is our president. Anna is our treasurer. And then we've got Evelyn as our secretary. 
Natalie is our Director of Marketing and I am the Director of Sponsorship and my name's Debbie. So I just want to kick today on behalf of the committee, um, a huge thanks obviously to our host, Giver Gradigo, for arranging the webinar today and to the speakers who we're really looking forward to hearing from and obviously learning some amazing tips on how to further our careers. Thanks for that, Debbie. Um, so I've got a couple of questions for you guys to find out some more about what you do. Um, so Eve, what inspired you to start up the society? Because I know you guys are quite new. Yeah, so, well, in our university, we didn't really have a society like this where women could point to within the PIR field. And we wanted to provide sort of a platform for anyone who is interested in these career paths to and also showcase women within the field so that you can get inspired and you can learn about all these different stories um, and obviously connect students to more people within the discipline and to learn about the different opportunities available for women within PIR. Well, that's great, thank you. So what kind of plans do you guys have coming up for the rest of the year? Um, so firstly, we are focusing on continuing our An Evening With series, which is basically a series of recurring events where we invite guest speakers from all around the world from different career paths within politics and IR, and they just share their experience and their advice with us in a very chatty and relaxed setting. Um, we actually have our next event for this series coming up next week, and we have Dr. Kaisa Wilson as our guest speaker. Then apart from that, we're also focusing on hosting panel discussions as we find them particularly enriching. And we're actually hosting a new panel discussion on the 26th of November with the Pride Sock here at the University of Edinburgh. We're going to be having queer women from politics and international relations discuss their experience as part of the LGBTQ community and within PIR. And finally, we're also trying to keep encouraging uh, participation from members and creating a sense of community. So we are actually building our website, which should be ready for the second semester this year, and where we plan on having a kind of a blog page where people can send their own articles of opinion and they will be able to interact with each other and comment on each other's work. That sounds brilliant, lots of exciting plans in the pipeline. So yeah. what kind of stuff are you guys doing day to day I guess to make those things come into action? How do you make that happen? Okay, um, so what we'll do, we'll have a weekly meeting once a week where we'll discuss any kind of upcoming events or general admin that needs to be sorted. And then we try to have a social like every Friday for our members. And these are kind of very casual affairs, just kind of like a nice catch up, little break from the manic academic week that's usually just happened. Um, and then with regards to like say speakers, panels and workshop events, we try to have one of those once a week, which have been hugely popular with our members. Um, and then with regards to like the day to day, it's very much our poor marketing director, Natalie, getting messages from us constantly being like, post us on social, post us on social. So it's a lot of that going on. But then the majority of the work committee is just kind of liaising with speakers, um, doing day to day admin that needs to be flagged, website development and reaching out to say various organisations for future partnerships and just genuinely trying to get the word out there about our society. Brilliant. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing. So I guess my final question for you guys is, um, is there a woman in particular in politics and international relationships that really inspires, inspires you and why? We did our first An Evening With series um, event was with Her Excellency Miss Maria Fernanda Espinosa, who has worked at the UN and was the Secretary General for a bit, I think for the 75th um, mission. And she is just probably one of the most remarkable high level um, politicians, diplomats, academics any of us have ever met. And I think the opportunity to interview her and just like discuss her life and um, kind of where she started from, again, like understanding that you don't necessarily have to start in the politics and IR world or like in the corporate world to kind of make it big as such. That was really inspiring for us. Um, and also because I think just hearing a perspective from somewhere that's not in the UK was really um, enriching to see how people around the world can like get involved in international relations, especially as a woman. 
yeah that's incredible when did you speak to her um so our talk was I think Monday 28th of September and again for that one we had quite a bit of marketing to do and like putting it out yeah. a lot of people came to watch which was really really um thrilling really good to see um because again it's she, she's someone that I think you can like obviously watch at the UN but to have that kind of one-to-one -one access with was um really remarkable yeah that's amazing oh well done guys you're doing an incredible job and thank you so much for your help with this webinar and for being on it and sharing a bit more about what you do today um I'm gonna go over to the next slide now and introduce student here so we've got with us today Holly Anna, and Emily who are going to share a bit more about what they do um, and the opportunities that they do have for students and volunteers at the moment. Um, so I'll pass it over to you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, before we start, I do again um, want to say a massive thank you to Katie and everyone at Give a Grad a Go. This is kind of our first um, event kind of speaking about student here and getting our name out. We're a relatively new company, so this is really, really nice. Thank you so much. Um, so a little bit about student here before we get on to um, our opportunities and what we what we can offer students or recent graduates. Um, we started in the heat of the COVID lockdown around April um, over a virtual coffee with a few of the people that we've networked with. We then became student here originally in partnership with Furlonteer, which was a organisation created to um, put furlough professionals in touch with charities and volunteering opportunities that they could use their spare time wisely with. Um, we then created student here, which does a, kind of the same thing, but instead with students and graduates who may have missed out on uh, some opportunities because of COVID. I know um, our co-founder Becca, her grad job got cancelled and my um, summer internship got cancelled and things like that. So we thought, um, you know, students are going to miss out on things. Why not give them this? So this is where we came up with placements with purpose. Um, it's a volunteering. We, we connect the students with the volunteers, with charities for them to volunteer in placements that we've made for them it's a really like quite a personal process um of the student applies to us gives us you know their skills their hobbies their interests their degree and we go through and, and look at take everything into account and match them with a charity um or not-for-profit that we think would match their skills perfectly um so we put together a little bit about the benefits of remote volunteering because obviously this is all remote um all through covid 82% of our hiring managers are more likely to choose a candidate with volunteering experience. And it's a great way to develop and apply your skills, show you're proactive, introduces you to new challenges and things you've never encountered, and lets you support a cause in need, which is really, really nice, as well as giving you something to focus on. Um, I know a lot of students during this time in lockdown have struggled um, with things like that and having so much spare time on their hands. So it's something that they can get involved and really get their teeth in um and yeah it's yeah it's, it's really really good oh, amazing thank you um so I guess my first question is what do you each do individually um in your roles as student here uh so I'll let Emily and Anna introduce themselves now yeah hi so I'm Emily and I'm the head of marketing at students here and um, so on a day-to-day -day basis I manage our marketing campaigns and our social media generally um, so yeah, I mean, the main message we try and get across to students and graduates is that this is a real opportunity to kind of give you a tailored placement, which is something that I've found really hard to come by. So, you know, if you'd like an opportunity with a charity where you can work in marketing, we can find that for you and match that for you. Or if you have one, or if you want a career in computing or accountancy, we kind of give you opportunities that are rooted in purpose that are otherwise really hard to come by and we kind of do that matchmaking process for you so we kind of yeah that's the message we try and get across and um, because obviously I know a lot of my friends especially during the COVID lockdown but just generally find it really difficult to find opportunities that are relevant to their career aspirations and so that's kind of the gap that we've tried to fill. Um, hi, I'm Anna and I'm currently the head of PR at Student Here. Um, I joined the team back in August, I think it was, um, and I've been loving it. It's, again, just great experience um, and great to have these kind of things to talk about when applying for grad jobs, um, all these skills that I'm learning. Um, for example, I helped kind of like set this up with Katie from Give a Grad a Go. Um, I'm just like really excited to be doing more events. Um, and generally spreading the word for student here. 
Um, my personal background is I graduated um, this year in, into the COVID madness um, with a law degree, but knowing that that wasn't what I wanted to do, I um, applied for a master's in marketing, but thought to myself, I don't have any experience in marketing and like, how am I going to get that in this, um, in this time where experience is so hard to come by? So myself, I was looking into student here just as a great service for trying to get um, experience. But when I saw that there was an opening at student here HQ, I thought, why not just jump for it, just go for it. Um, and it's been great. I've loved being involved with it all. Um, it's a really, really great um, organization. Um, so pleased to be involved with it. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, and you guys are doing an absolutely amazing job. Um, so I don't know if you want to share a bit about how things have changed from when you first started to where you are now, because you've obviously done amazingly in that time. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, uh, myself and Emily joined in the same week. Um, we were the first actual kind of, not staff members, because it is all run by volunteers, but we were the first people to kind of come on board and start creating student here from scratch. So the idea was there, it was a bit in the air. Um, and just through some really good networking, we, we were able to connect with um, Becca, who founded it and create Student Here um, back in, oh gosh, we probably launched, did we launch in June, Emily? Yeah, June. I think in June, it was me, you and Becca. And then over the course of about maybe 10 days, we had a team of maybe 10 people and it just kind of grew from there, didn't it? Yeah, and growing not only internally, but externally as well. So um, just this week, just with, just this week we've reached uh, almost 2,000 students which is amazing that have signed up to the service um, and we've also reached now we're a team of 30 um, internal staff members which is amazing um, and from past research that I've been doing over the couple past couple of months we are all the 23 out of 20 no 28 out of 30 are female internally and then about 72 percent of our um volunteers who've signed up through student here a female as well which we found really really interesting as a brand that was created by a woman and now run by women um it's really nice you know to see that we've still we kind of carry on that demographic we are of course completely gender diverse and things like that but we we appeal a lot more to women we've found um which is great it is re it's really really good no oh, that's amazing um, and of course, the big news is that you guys have become a certified company, which is absolutely amazing. So massive well done there. Thank you. Um, so I know you guys mentioned that you've got the student here internship. Would you be happy to tell everyone on the webinar a little bit more about that and how they might be able to get involved? Yeah, of course. So um, the student here internship is something that we only just started about two months ago. It was piloted by um, Chris and Amy, who are part of our internal team. Um, and they they put themselves in an intern's position for a month and thought what would it be like you know interning at student here hq because at the minute we are um we've got about two thousand student signups but you know we don't have two thousand projects to give them and we find a lot of the time the students kind of waiting around to get opportunities it's very slow on the charities front um but the student here internship provides them with some work experience that you know we don't have to do charity outreach to get they can just come direct to us which is brilliant so they come on board for a month and um, well for four weeks in total the first two weeks doing charity outreach looking at um it's usually themed it's usually either a subject or an issue uh, so like a social issue we did environment and a subject we're doing creative arts at the minute um, and they look at charities and societies within universities um things like that directly focused on these topics, outreach to them, see if they want to, you know, come into partnership or offer some off opportunities to them. And then in week three and four, um, they work alongside our marketing team and our PR team as well. So they get a little bit of experience in each sector, which is really, really nice for them. And they go away with kind of a snippet of experience in, in any sector that they want, which kind of helps any confusion or any little like no one knows what they want to do so if they're unsure about the sector that they want to go in it's a really nice way to kind of get a little bit of each yeah absolutely um, and i guess for everyone that's on the webinar that might be thinking that's something they would like to get involved with and apply um would you guys be able to share the link with everyone after the webinar or perhaps on the chat at some point um and then perhaps they can get involved as well um 
and there are many reasons why you should get involved. Um, and I'll let you guys share the success story that I know you mentioned to me earlier and we have in the slides. Um, yeah, so over to you. So this success story is one very close to my heart. Um, Alex, who uh, start, was kind of one of the first people on our PR team um, when student here started, didn't have any experience in PR. She had a degree in marketing, um, but no work experience and, and was desperately searching for a grad job, really struggled. Um, came on board to student here for about six months. Um, she only left, what, two weeks ago? I already miss her. Um, she was absolutely amazing. And from student here managed to bag herself a graduate job at one of the top um, PR firms in London, which is just amazing. And, and she said her in both her interview and her CV, having student here on there really, really helped. And the employer was so interested in, um, what she did and how she you know it was a volunteer position and things like that um which just proves I mean that volunteering it just opened so many doors um and it did for Alex yeah yeah that's amazing that's such a great example of how much you guys are helping other people and I guess yourselves and boosting your CV as well so really brilliant thank you so much for sharing um so for the final section of our webinar um I'm going to be speaking to Amber Seller, who is a venture co-founder at Datatonic. Uh, when I spoke to Amber first, she shared with me her absolutely incredible career story, which I'm so excited for you guys to get a bit of an insight into as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Amber, for being here. No worries. Thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, so nice to hear about student here as well. I really wish that had existed uh, when I graduated. So yeah, what a good idea. Very cool. Thank you. Um, so I guess the first question that I've asked you is what advice would you offer to graduates struggling to find a job in a pandemic? Um, I know we've kind of touched in the past about your degree being about the skills and not the subject. Is that something that you found in your experience? Yeah, definitely. So if you'd, I mean, yeah, kind of two things, I guess I, when I graduated uh, over a decade ago now, which this makes me feel very old, this webinar, but um, it was in the middle of the last big recession. Um, it's not a patch on COVID, so I can only imagine how stressful it is for everyone that's uh, graduating or kind of job seeking now. But um, I remember that kind of sheer panic, basically, of thinking, oh my God, I just have to get a job. Um, and I did English at university at Nottingham, um, was really torn for the whole time that I was applying uh, a level kind of point uh, between economics and English. And I remember even my tutor at the time saying, you know, I, I can't help you here. Like those are such different routes. So you, you just got to kind of decide on one essentially. And I was so worried that I had um, kind of pigeonholed myself into, you know, being, as you said at the start, uh, Katie, like, you know, a, a book uh, author or, you know, an English teacher or a journalist or something. Um, and actually my advice to everyone would be it, it that just isn't the case like unless you're doing something like medicine or you know something that's really vocational and, and where the subject is so important actually what matters is all the skills that you learn I think Lindsay kind of touched on this as well earlier it's those kind of transferable skills so like English for example made me very analytical it made me good at um, you know kind of researching sources it meant that I had good attention to detail um, working during university as well just meant I had good kind of time management and you know sort of balancing of deadlines that kind of thing I mean I'm not gonna lie I was always a like essay the night before person like the last uh, draft of it but knowing that you can actually do that and achieve it even that is really good experience to get and um, yeah I think kind of my main advice would be don't you know don't kind of don't feel like you have to apply for stuff because it's relevant for your degree subjects just focus on getting a job that you think some elements of it appeal to you and that you would enjoy um for me that meant I, I kind of fell into a sales role um at time inc which at the time and i think still is uh, the biggest media company on the planet uh, so after a grueling interview process um, with very little or no sales experience but some kind of fundraising and stuff at uni um yeah just decided to get a job uh, to start earning some money after uni in a week after graduating was sat in a chair with no idea really how i got there um, but it meant I at least kind of started uh, on the process. So I, I'd say kind of don't, yeah, don't focus too much on the degree that you've done. Think more about kind of what you actually want to spend your time doing. Um, and yeah, just, just try not to kind of, don't panic. Um, and whilst I would say don't jump into a first role, I did that and I don't, I don't regret it. So I would say there's not kind of a right or wrong way of doing it. Like just because you're job seeking during a pandemic uh, and a recession. Um, so kind of double whammy now uh you know it, whatever's right for you is right for you basically so um yeah 
I hope that's helpful. <laughs> no, that would be really helpful. So I know you mentioned like even from when you were at university still and you started doing your fundraising, you always said like get out, getting out of your comfort zone is something that's really valuable. I think especially to any students or graduates that might be on the webinar who want to go for roles, but maybe they don't have that experience yet and they're struggling to get to it. Um, I guess in those sort of two things combined, having no experience and getting out of your comfort zone, what advice would you give to those people who aren't sure how to go about doing that? Yeah, sure. So it's that it's that kind of awful catch 22, isn't it, where you apply for you can. I remember, yeah, as a grad applying for junior kind of you know entry level roles, but they are asking for two years experience. And it's kind of like, how are you possibly meant to have that when you've been uh, doing your degree during that time? But um, I would say, uh, particularly for anyone that's on the webinar that's still um, studying currently and has the option of getting some kind of part-time work or work around it or even if you just graduated stuff things like student here like those kind of examples and that success story are really a really good example of where all experience is valuable all experience is relevant like I um, worked from the age of 14 all the way through university and whilst I did not want to work in a shoe shop or Greg's or Woolworth's uh, all the jobs I had before I don't think Wool I mean Woolworth's closed in 2009 so that's gonna make me sound really old but um, you know none of those were dream careers for me but having kind of you know a Saturday job or part-time jobs I ended up talking about that stuff loads on my CV and on my LinkedIn profile and an interview because things like kind of customer facing roles stuff like you know proving that you're trustworthy and reliable like being asked to kind of cash up a till or lock a shop it, I think when you're at university especially if you're doing quite a kind of you know academic subject and um, if you're a bit of a geek like me it's easy to think that those jobs aren't going to be that valuable to you when you're uh, applying for stuff but they really are so um, I think again similar to the kind of skills not subject focus think about the type of responsibilities that you have in that sort of work and um, if there's anyone on the webinar that's graduated that hasn't had a part-time job through uni because you maybe you haven't had to which is like there's nothing wrong with not needing to work and be kind of you know financially supporting yourself but I'd say kind of get get some experience as soon as you can and again coming back to that kind of student here example if that's volunteer experience great um, speaking as someone on the other side of the table now in interviews that kind of stuff really does matter if someone comes in and they've never had work experience but they've gone out of their way to as you said put themselves out of their comfort zone and you know volunteer in a role where actually maybe it's it doesn't come as kind of naturally to them it's such a good sign of kind of ambition and drive and confidence um, and yeah as you said for me that was uh, becoming a chugger uh, as they get called a kind of street fundraiser um, literally just because I was shy and was terrible at talking to new people so I thought you know sadist that I am uh, why don't I get a job where I have to stop people in the street and ask them for money so um, yeah actually I was very good at it and I credit that with yeah making me a lot more confident and kind of able to yeah sort of step out of that that comfort zone so I think don't be afraid to challenge yourself worst case scenario it goes horribly wrong um, and you can always leave you're not tied in for life to working somewhere yeah absolutely um so I know you mentioned uh just now that obviously now coming from being the chugger to where you are today you are on the other side of the interview table so when you're sitting there what advice would you have to sort of graduates who might be being interviewed by you if you were hiring them what qualities would you want to see I know uh, you've spoken before about being like a big fish in a small pond and the benefits of that um what I guess what advice in general would you have for those people who are on the other side of the table which might be most of the people on the webinar here yeah for sure so um yeah again kind of covering both points I guess so the big fish in a small pond um conversation that we had was kind of around you know work experience that you might have um again you know working in a smaller business you you tend to get given a lot more responsibility quickly um I know a lot of people are, are kind of really passionate about like the big four and you know getting a grad scheme role somewhere and that's great and there's nothing wrong with with wanting that but actually a lot of the time I think it's easy to kind of underestimate that um time inc for example where I was working huge huge company it would have taken me five years minimum to get to the point where I was a manager I left there after 12 months uh, so I worked there for a year after I graduated left there um, went to a much smaller company so a local publisher still a, still a decent sized company so not a kind of startup but much much smaller um, and 12 months later I was a manager and I was managing a team of 10 people and most of them were 10 years older than me and actually that would never have happened if I'd stayed in 
the massive kind of corporation with all the red tape um so yeah i think kind of don't you know don't get too hung up unless it's something that for you it's you know a real kind of passion and, you, and for other reasons you really want to work in a big corporation don't be afraid to get involved in a smaller business make sure it's a stable business if you can i know that's hard in you know kind of covid times because um you know things are kind of quite up in the air but do a bit of research first you know, make sure it's not a kind of two-man band unless that's what you're looking for um and yeah then in, in terms of kind of what I'd look for I guess and, and your question around sort of being on the other side of the table just show your personality like just don't be afraid to um yeah don't be afraid to you know kind of actually be yourself in an interview I know it sounds incredibly cliche but even at this stage now so I moved jobs three and a half months ago having been at my old company for seven and a half years that was a huge step for me I still have on my CV video games and jigsaw puzzles in my interest section I still like I don't need to have that now like they don't care no one asks if I go for walks on the beach people don't really care about hobbies when you know you're kind of a bit later on in your career but my view is always if you're really you know kind of authentic and you really actually get your personality across best case scenario the person interviewing you asks about it you find a shared connection you find kind of a topic that you both enjoy and you're probably going to get on with that person and enjoy working with them worst case scenario they think that that's really weird in which case you're not going to enjoy working there you're not going to enjoy working for those people so um yeah just I, I, I guess you know be realistic about the fact that there's hundreds of people um searching for jobs at the moment obviously competition will be fiercer um sign up with a good recruiter like give it right a go uh who you know you guys are really good at championing uh, championing your candidates and kind of pushing them to the top of the pile so to speak which is why i've placed people with you in the past um but yeah, just kind of try and make sure that you stand out in some way. All of Lindsay's advice about uh, LinkedIn, I think, is hugely valuable as well. It's, again, stuff that I wish I'd had um, when I kind of started job seeking. I dread to think what mine looked like then. Yeah, but you've had some amazing ways of getting jobs in the past. I know when we spoke before, you mentioned your uh, video game example, which I absolutely loved. <laughs> um, you can share that again. That was my favourite. <laughs> Yeah, so it's yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's ever helped me get a job, but it, uh, just a kind of side, a side theory that I have that um, for anyone on the webinar who is a bit of a, you don't have to be a geek to work in a tech company, by the way, I just happen to, uh, to be one. But um, yeah, the like, uh, the video game uh, interest, I have this theory that yeah, people that play certain types of video games are perfect for certain types of roles and kind of vice versa. So um, yeah, for me, it meant that my previous role when I kind of got to the point where I was COO so I was like heading up operations for the business I think actually that's as a day-to-day -day, that type of work is so similar to kind of strategy games like that to me was theme hospital but with a tech company or you know age of empires but with a business like it's anything where you're spinning loads of different plates all the time you've kind of got to keep you know keep an eye on lots of different variables you then have yeah, people that that's their idea of hell in a video game and actually they'd rather play like the sims or they'd rather play um yeah i don't know minecraft or something kind of a little bit more creative and you know where they're kind of not tied to a particular route and they're not they don't have kind of set objectives um i'm convinced there's a, a kind of whole recruitment uh, angle here so yeah i feel like maybe you guys should start that as a sort of screening process possibly yeah definitely especially for tech industries <laughs> Yeah, but it would probably go down very well, I imagine. Yeah. It does do jigsaw puzzles, by the way. So if you're like me and you're secretly an old lady and a 15-year-old boy <laughs> simultaneously and you like video games and jigsaws, uh, yeah, so far I haven't had an interview um, where those things haven't come up and people haven't said, oh, yeah, I love those. Maybe it's because of lockdown, possibly. Yeah, definitely. And banana bread. Um, yeah. We've got a couple of questions that have come through, but I think I might need to stop sharing my screen to see them okay so somebody's asked amber what are your best and worst hiring interview moments either as an interviewee or as the hiring manager that is a very good question uh so interviewee actually would be a really recent one uh, and it was it the joys of interviewing virtually um i had 10 no nine sorry stages of interviews for this role and in the first one i having not interviewed for yeah, the best part of a decade before that I was understandably quite nervous and followed all those tips that you suggested you know had I had my plant I had my kind of you know no washing in the screen um and was in full flow uh, answering a question and the guy just left 
the uh, hangout. So he just left the video call and I was literally like, is this a test? Do I sit here? How long do I wait? Um, it turns out there was a power cut in Kennington where he was based and yeah that was why so then I had to kind of like reschedule the whole thing but um, yeah I sat there for a good five minutes thinking does this mean that I've not got the job um, best one definitely when uh, I feel like I can name her if I don't say her surname but someone called Emma uh, from my old company who um, I still mentor and kind of keep in touch with now but when someone walked into an interview and literally within five minutes of her speaking it was so obvious that she'd be perfect for the company and perfect for the role and she was and it was in not just I'm not just saying this to kind of back up what I said before but uh, it was entirely down to personality the fact that she went straight in talking about kind of volunteering work she'd done she'd done loads of charity work during uni to raise money for sending sanitation products to parts of sub-Saharan Africa and working with women's charities and she was just so passionate and she had no experience at all that was relevant for the role but she just came across perfectly um and yeah it was just really herself uh, so yeah definitely just really memorable interviewees I guess that um yeah just kind of stood out so pretty much what I was saying before but she stood yeah. out because she was herself no definitely so that kind of leads to our second question actually that we got asked how do you stand out from the crowd during an interview either face to face or virtually so I know you said um, obviously have that personality be yourself I guess do you have any tips for bringing that across especially virtually now when it might be slightly harder I'd say try and remember like try and remember that the person that's interviewing you is also probably sat in their living room or a spare room is probably as I am now surrounded by boxes and just kind of rubbish that you can't see uh, try and like try and treat them like a human being so kind of you know ask them some questions like don't just sort of say like hi how are you at the start and then don't really care about the answer like feel free to say you know have you had a good week like how are you loving lockdown at the moment you know have you taken up any new hobbies like ask them one of the questions I asked in uh, the interviews for this role was the guy who interviewed me I think the second or third one I said to him you know what's like what's your favorite thing about working at the company like what what kind of what made you take the role when you joined a year and a half ago and I don't think anyone had ever asked him and he kind of went off on this tangent all about how much he loves the culture and the people and it's like this is what I want to hear so yeah uh, just just treat the person that's interviewing you like a human being so remember that they have a personality and maybe they're just not showing it because they're trying to be quite formal obviously judge it depending on how kind of formal the interview is but um, just be friendly basically would be the quicker way of answering that. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, someone else asked, I guess, on the flip side, is there anything that would instantly put you off hiring someone? Lateness, for sure. So uh, definitely, um, yeah, lateness and in, in a kind of virtual setting, I guess, just not being respectful of the interviewer's time. So just because it's virtual, still, you know, still make sure that you've double checked in the same way that if you're going to a physical interview when life was normal, uh, you would if you were me get there like half an hour early you'd make sure that you know you knew where like you could nip to the loo first like make sure you look uh, normal before the interview uh, you know grab a drink if you need to you should still treat a virtual interview as uh, the same level of importance so make sure that like you said before I think you know your wi-fi is working log on before if you can um, you know double check that the links are working and everything just yeah just just kind of be really respectful of the other person's time otherwise I think it's just such a bad sign if someone's not taking the interview seriously enough then how are they possibly going to be trusted to kind of work from home and um yeah kind of actually do the role yeah it's very true I guess especially with things virtually you can't make up the excuse that your train's delayed or anything no. like and, that. <laughs> and even if yeah and even if something terrible does happen like say there was a power cut there's yeah. always a way of getting in touch so again it's more it's less about being late or not turning up it's more about respecting the person's time so um yeah just always you know even if you're having an absolute nightmare and you can't log on just call the person like on an old school phone call uh, and they'll probably just appreciate you saying it and you can probably just talk to them that way yeah absolutely thank you um so i know we're running slightly over time is everyone okay to answer just a couple more questions cool perfect um so i've got another one for amber quickly and then one for student here after so someone's asked how should you end the interview I guess I know from my experience, they normally get ended by the person interviewing, but um, Amber, I don't know if you'd agree with this. I think it's always quite good. We always tell people to ask questions at the end as well. Yeah, definitely. So I, yeah, I think ask questions. Um, don't ask questions for the sake of it. Like the thing that I would say is it's so obvious if you're kind of just 
you know, spouting questions that you've, you've Googled, what questions should I ask in the interview? Ask questions that are relevant to the conversation that you've just had. So um, it's obviously important to ask the stuff that I'm sure Katie and, and Will and the team would, would tell you to. So things like, you know, what are the kind of next steps? When are you likely to hear? Um, it's great to show that you're keen as well. Like, you know, sometimes as an interviewer, it can feel like some people are just kind of going through the motions a little bit, or you can tell they've just applied for loads of jobs um, and maybe they're not that fussed about this one. So if you can ask anything, you know, maybe it's, um, yeah, something's doing, you know, what, like, what's the next big event that you guys have got coming up? So like Datatonic, for example, we do lots of um, webinars and events and stuff like this. You might want to mention one that you've seen recently. If you genuinely found it interesting, I don't, you know, pretend if you didn't. Um, but yeah, ask if there's anything similar coming up, kind of, yeah, just again, ask something that's relevant to the conversation, I think. But yeah, you're, I think you're right. The interview will normally kind of properly end it. Yeah. Hopefully. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I guess on the topic of sort of events and exciting opportunities coming up, um, our other question that we got asked to kind of goes to the student here team. When is the deadline for applying for the student here internship? And are there any specific skills that you're looking for? Uh, so the current student here internship is in the deadlines in two weeks and um, it'll be like midway through November towards the end um, we're not super strict on it so I won't worry um, we've got two internships available we're looking through December we're looking at youth homelessness and poverty within the UK and that's going to be the charity like issue focus and then the subject focus is the I think it's education yes it's education um, so looking at people maybe studying education especially or wanting to go into education after they graduate um, would be the perfect kind of candidate for that specific skills that we look for we look for definitely motivation and you know to come up with your own ideas and have a little bit of creativity about it is definitely key and um, I think if you you know to come into an internship and just want to be do, to do what you're told is kind of the bare minimum and um, when you're going into an internship with us we want to hear your ideas and what you want to you know what you want to get out of it and um, as much as what you know as doing the job that you need to do and um, so definitely a bit of creativity and a bit of um you know motivation in your own ideas things like that great thank you hopefully we'll get a few applicants from the webinar maybe um and then I'll go back to another one to Amber. I really like this question because it's very on topic with the theme of the webinar. Um, so somebody asked, Amber, why is the tech sector hard to join as a female? How do they navigate the obstacles that are in place in such a male dominated sector? That is a very good question. Um, and yeah, unfortunately it is still incredibly uh, male dominated. So um, I, being honest, I think my advice would be Re try and research the company first so don't just think about tech as a sector think about it as all sectors are as a kind of cluster of lots of different companies and lots of different subsectors. find out if there are companies that are really you know kind of spearheading and kind of championing um, female talent within tech because it is because it is so skewed towards um, male employees and male candidates it's something that actually companies again like Datatonic um, and places like Google and you know lots of companies have specific programs to try and encourage women to apply and it's not about hiring a woman because she's a woman it's about hiring the best person for the job but making sure that those women who are amazing apply for the roles in the first place so um, and also remember in tech that's not just you know developer roles that's roles like mine it's operations roles it's marketing roles HR it's all the other kind of um, functions as well um so yeah i guess my advice would be don't be put off by um tech it's you know tech is the future like some of the projects that we do in our company are honestly like wizardry it's um like we're living in the future um, it's it blows my mind when i think how excited i would have thought this was when i was a little kid um and still do now uh so yeah don't be afraid to join it um it's a really exciting sector but have a look into kind of which parts of it you're interested in um, and then if you can find areas that you really, really like, so for me, that's artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I just think it's fascinating. Um, then it was about looking at specific companies. So I didn't, I applied for this role because I loved the fact that Datatonic had, um, like we have a Slack channel called Lady Tonic. That's like all the women employees, you know, they do, we do like regular Lady Tonic events. They do drinks. They have a diversity group that's uh, made up of, um, different genders internally and they host kind of regular events and, um, you know, get feedback and 
uh, I think it's just really good to have companies where they're aware that they're in an industry that has quite a strong bias, whether it's gender or you know anything else, age could be anything, um, and are trying to do something about it. So um, definitely apply. Uh, don't be kind of scared of applying. The reason that it's such a male sector is because lots of women are just scared to get into it, if that makes sense. So just the first step is just, yeah, find find a company or find a, a part of tech that you, you know, are excited by and just start applying um, and you never know. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I'll just have two more questions. I'll give another one for a student here and then a final one with Amber, if that's OK with you guys, and then we can finish off there. Um, so the next question for student here is, are there any opportunities within the student here HQ available at the moment? I know you've mentioned your internship, but I'm not sure if there's anything else that you wanted to add on from there. Yeah, so apart from the internship, um, we're always, you know, looking for new people within student here HQ. Um, we're all run completely by volunteers. So it is just on a as and when basis. If you've got the time to commit, then send in your CV um, and we'll have a look. We are currently looking for um, a web developer. So if anyone has any web development skills or knows anyone with web development skills, then do send them our way. Um, and also, you know, we're always looking for people to join the matching team. That's an especially um, hard team to 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 do with just the small people that we've got um, and they kind of they match the opportunities with the students and do it in a really nice like personal way and um, so it's a great it's a really great opportunity a lot of chatting to students getting to know the charities building great relationships networking it's huge for networking and um, so yeah our recruitment process is usually just sending your cv to hello at student um, and i'll pick it up um, but yeah Great, thank you. Um, and this final one, Amber, no pressure, is is it better to go through using a recruiter or to go directly when you're applying for a job? So I would say when you're, and this is, I'm going to answer this as if you're not even here, Katie, but I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I'm going to be honest anyway. I would say when you're a graduate and you don't, you're, you physically can't have the level of experience that you might want or need for certain roles. So, you know, all of the stuff that I've said about kind of you know Sainsbury's jobs on the weekend and you know Greg's and stuff and there's yes that experience is valuable but you're still more likely to struggle if you're up against um, a direct candidate who's applying who's got two years already in that industry you're always going to come off better and you're more likely to get to interview stage if you're coming through a good graduate specific recruiter so actually I would say further down your career like I didn't go through a recruiter to move recently but that was because I didn't I didn't feel like I needed to I was literally researching kind of companies I like the look of and you know applying and just decided to do that during a pandemic because I'm crazy but um when you're a graduate I I'm not just saying this because Katie's here I definitely think someone like give a grad a go is you're you're better off going with them because you're not just going to be kind of one cv you know in, in a ream of 300 um you'll be probably you know one of four or five candidates that they genuinely will have got to know you and actually kind of picked you know picked that role specifically for you and spoken to you about it and um, it's not to say that direct applicants don't get the same level of, you know, kind of um, review and, and care, I guess, in the process because they do. And obviously it's, you know, as a company, it, you need to be quite kind of careful about those processes, but it's just as a recruiter, it's a lot easier to sort of trust that, um, you know, as an internal recruiter, sorry, that uh, an external company like Give a Go has kind of done a bit of the legwork for you and sort of filtered through that pile of CVs and found the most relevant people for the role. So, um, yeah, not not just biased towards uh, Katie and Will and the team who are great, but um, I would say as a graduate, definitely go with a recruiter, but go with a good recruiter that's um, kind of relevant for your sector or your level or um, who you just feel supported by, basically. Well, thank you. And thanks so much to students here as well and University of Edinburgh women in politics and international relationships for your help with the webinar and yeah and Amber and Lindsay earlier for being here as well to answer those questions. Um, we are running out of time so I will leave the rest of the questions but please feel free to send them in. Um, you can contact us all, we're all on LinkedIn um, 
I've got a few opportunities as well, which I'll send around in an email to all the people that have attended the webinar. Uh, this will just contain some links to our graduate blog writing program, um, our current partnership with Livly, where you can get £300 off your rent, um, and some more opportunities like that with us. And I'm sure Holly and Anna and Emily won't mind if we also share the link to the student to sign up as well. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, for being on the webinar and everyone who's attended. It's been lovely having you all.